Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I don't know if it's really wise to be here and to give this talk because people might be more interested in my own stuff about Marx principle and cosmology with Marx principle <coughs> or people may appreciate more if I mock the parallel universes or the anthropic principle and uh, so I'm not sure it's wise because uh, solar astrophysics is a sane research field but I consider it as <coughs> my duty as a scientist to present the work of Pierre-Marie Robitaille which is about an alternative model of the Sun based on liquid metallic hydrogen and I think his work is vastly underestimated and very significant. Now um, when I start to point out a few problems of the standard solar model, I'd like to begin with the pictures I saw here at the conference. I was impressed by these pictures. And uh, these pictures are impressive because they have a very good resolution. The resolution is about is less than 0.1 arc seconds, which corresponds to some tens of kilometers. But the strange thing is, the standard solar model postulates that the thickness of the layer where these pictures are generated is several hundred kilometers or even a hundred kilometers. Now, how could this be possible? If turbulent processes and fast processes extending over a depth of a hundred or several hundred kilometers how can they produce patterns of a much smaller scale that should be smoothed out? I think this is a contradiction and even if even with, uh, with the very high opacities the standard solar model postulates this remains a contradiction and this is an opportunity to wonder about the opacities which are postulated by the standard solar model, the big question is how can the photosphere produce a Planck spectrum? A pl Actually, the photosphere can produce this because um, a Planck spectrum is usually created by condensed matter because you need all the oscillators because this is a continuous spectrum you need all the frequencies and in a solid body and a liquid evidently you have all the oscillators but once you have a gaseous body these oscillators are not there gases emit in bands and they have distinct frequencies plainly speaking if the sun, uh, very gaseous, it should emit more like a, a gas discharge lamp than the observed spectrum. So how is this appearance of the Planck spectrum justified by the standard model? The standard model says, well, the continuous spectrum is created at layers beyond and then the outer layers filter everything what is left, everything what is uh, created by a higher temperature inside the sun. So these assumptions are very strange because you need to assume that once you go to deeper layers you have a higher temperature in every, uh, in every layer there is a corresponding Planck spectrum of higher temperatures but this higher temperature Planck spectrum doesn't appear at the surface, but rather a part of it gets filtered and the rest appears as a Planck spectrum of a lower temperature. 
This is quite miraculous if you think about atomic physics. And let's look what uh, Pierre Robitaille points out. He has written a brilliant paper about the historical aspects of, of Kirchhoff's law of thermal regulation, which is um, very relevant to the theoretical arguments provided by the standard model. And he points out the major flaws which are still present in this very old law. I recommend to read this paper. Now, um, think about uh, it's not valid only for the sun. You need the surface is obvious, what the standard model says, it's obvious the surface can produce these. 6,000 Kelvin Planck spectrum. So the postulate is that astrophysics is requiring that a perfect mixture of atoms, ions, and electrons exists at all layers within the sun. In each layer, these mixtures could then produce the desired local black body spectrum. Within each solar layer, a new perfect mixture must exist in order that its absorptive characteristics enable the production of a new shifted thermal spectrum. This is a very, this requires a very complicated exercise in assumptions about the, about solar opacities, but still it's miraculous that Planck spectra occur. Now another um, very strange um, result is the emergence of the, the um, waves created by coronal ejections. Um, Rolf Schlichemeyer criticized that I presented this picture because he said that these are not real pictures. It's, it's, uh, these structures are recovered from Doppler data. But actually, that's what the website says. The solar quake that the science team recorded looks much like ripples spreading from a rock dropped into a pool of water. So however these um, pictures may be reconstructed, the rest, by the way, looks very much like a real picture. But it's certainly, it, the, evidence, the evidence may be not as compelling, but it certainly does not contradict that the surface is actually a distinct surface of a liquid. But now let's um, go to a to a case which is, in my opinion, even more compelling. I have made two slides, and you can look at these, look at the difference. This is a coronal ejection, and you look at this uh, heating point, and I will just, but I can um, show you the video here. So. Oh, we don't have the sound here yet. Do we have the sound here? No, anyway, it's not, it's not really important. It's, the picture is important. So we just, ah, okay. So look at this. This is uh, taken from the website. Um, look at this coronal ejection. And now you see the lighting up. When it comes back, the material, it lights up again. How is this possible? Can you repeat it? Let's see, it shows it two times. And again, you see you see this lightening up at the surface of the sun. Again, the same ejection. The material goes up and it falls down. And when it hits the surface, you see this little, you see this little light. So how is this possible? If it's a gas, so you would assume that the denser part is ejected in a, less, in, a, in, in a gas with less density and it falls back. What happens if a denser gas passes a, a gas with less density? Nothing happens. It just distributes. 
it just becomes less dense. So why, is, why are these bright spots here? The bright spots are here because this might be a real surface. And this is, might be real material, condensed, real condensed matter material, which is ejected from the sun. So I would invite you to think about that these so-called illusionary surface could be a real surface of the sun. And it pretty much looks like a real surface. And if there is a lesson to draw from history, that sometimes we should believe what we see. Even if it sounds strange, and of course there are counter-arguments, but unconsciously, the counter-argument is very much like this. That's what geologists in the 1920s said about Wigner's hypothesis of the continental drift. If we are to believe Wigner's hypothesis, we must forget everything which has been learned in the last 70 years and start all over, all over again. And I think that solar astrophysics might be in the very same situation. But this is, and of course, there is an alternative model. Geologists at the time proposed land bridges that explained the extra geological and fossil evidence that Alfred Wigner had presented, and it worked quite well. But this is not to dismiss this old model. It's not, it's not dismissing the current standard model. So why couldn't the geologists at the time believe that? Uh, continental drift was real because they couldn't understand the alternative. Because nobody could imagine processes inside the earth that m were able to move the continents. And this is the big barrier that uh, I think solar astrophysics had faced. We couldn't imagine an alternative. But Wigner and Huntington in 1935 and mind, 1935, this was long after the gaseous sun was established. Noted that hydrogen has an interesting double structure. Of course, it can make covalent bonds and arrange in molecules, but at the same time, it's also, so to speak, the zero element of the alkali metals. So, what hydrogen can do is to release one, it's, it's only electron, and the protons may form something like a metal. Uh, and uh, this is a real possibility. There is a metallic state of hydrogen, and uh, it's investigated at the time this is, a, this is a phase diagram. Obviously, it's not an easy field. It, there's a lot of, of research to, do, uh, to be done, and it's a lot of, of research underway in uh, condensed matter physics. And the situation is unique because you have, this, you have these competing states of these competing phases of H2 and the metallic. <coughs> and each of them is showing up in a solid and a liquid and in a gaseous phase. So, and we are in a regime of, of very high pressures uh, at, the, at the transition point. And it's quite clear that you need very high pressures if you want to condense molecular hydrogen because you have to break up simultaneously all the covalent bonds and you need a, a tremendous activation energy. By the way, <laughs> It's, it's, uh, it's now common wisdom that the planets consist of, uh, in the interior consist of um, metallic hydrogen. So I wonder what happens to a brown dwarf. It becomes more heavier, so suddenly 
it changes, everything changes, I don't know. Anyway, what I want to point, point out is that people still say, okay, this is absurd, this is nonsense, because uh, we don't have pressures of 250 gigabars at the surface of the sun. Correct. But there might be a metastable state of liquid metallic hydrogen at much lower pressure. Look at this. It's very easy. If you go up the, uh, if you look at the alkali metals, they have a very, very high boiling temperature. So there is no, uh, there is no obvious reason against the assumption that liquid metallic hydrogen may have a very high boiling point of several thousand kelvins at normal conditions. It's simply because hydrogen likes very much forming molecules, but that doesn't mean that it dislikes forming a metal. As a consequence, passing from that molecular state to the metallic state requires a high activation energy and high pressure, but metallic hydrogen may be stable at photo photospheric conditions at the same time. Now, is this an outlandish proposal of some freakish people, you may assume? Look at what NASA says. Metallic hydrogen, a game changer in a rocket propellant. Atomic metallic hydrogen, if metastable, at ambient pressure. That's not an outlandish proposal. And the authors here say, it's, uh, they are in Harvard, atomic metallic hydrogen is predicted to metastate. Of course, we have to do research and we have to evaluate. It's not easy. But the possibility is real. And if NASA isn't wasting its money, then solar astrophysics has overlooked something very significant. So, to summarize the content, I believe that the standard model is a contradiction with the high resolution images of the sun. The sum of non-thermal absorption processes as postulated by the standard solar model cannot explain the appearance of a Planck spectrum in stars. Many observations point to a distinct surface. Oh, yeah, I forgot to talk about the coronal heating problem because once you have a condensed matter material ejected from the surface of the sun, it easily can be charged by uh, friction in a way that it strips off all the electrons of, of atoms in, in the chromosphere. So if you wonder about this 13-fold ionized iron, it's not necessary a thermal ionization. It can be just stripped off by uh, pieces of or drops of, of liquid hydrogen so you don't need these exaggerated temperatures in the corona which cause a lot of trouble. Metallic hydrogen thought its existence is in astrophysics is secured may have a metastable state compa compatible with photospheric conditions. And last but not least, simplicity is an issue if you think about the opacities. Well, um, that's what I had to say about the content. And I would recommend that uh, you have a look at the papers. That's very beautifully uh, outlined in Robbie Tai's papers and his talks. And uh, a summary is given in this uh, volume of progress in physics. But certainly, I'm not as crazy to believe that with a 15 minutes talk, I have convinced everybody that the standard solar model is wrong. And I cannot even claim that every problem has been resolved in detail. But what I can testify, and I think that every honest scientist is able to testify that Robitaille's research is brilliantly documented. It's well argued and it demonstrates a sound knowledge of all the general physics fields involved. 
So if Robitaille is right, it's not just interesting, it's painful. And such painful paradigm shattering attacks, they use to bias our judgment of scientific theories. That's a matter of fact. And Robitaille is practically silenced in the scientific community. And this becomes an issue of method and scientific ethics. So I think you can and you should disagree with Robitaille as much as, as violently as you can. You're invited to. But I'd like to be the following attitude to be taken. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And if we try to put this into practice, those who are reviewers and editors, why don't you invite a paper? Those who organize seminars, why don't you invite the talk? Why don't you debate it? I think that Robert Hayes' ideas are sound and they ought to be discussed if the field wants to preserve its integrity. Thank you very much for your patience and go ahead with questions. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Here's a question. Thank you. Uh, can you go back to the uh, one of the, look, the, look at the last uh, few graphs where you say that one cannot explain the uh, spectral uh, shape of the continuum of the sun without making some very uh, strange assumptions. Yes. I think it was the third last Was it that or was it the text? One of the last uh, falls, one of the third last one of you Ah, you mean the conclusions? Where you summed up your... Uh, okay, so let's summer. get to the conclusions again. Yeah, the point is that you need, I mean, you can explain it, but you need a very, very many... First the question. Um, I disagree. We can do that. If the, the, in the case of the sun, the continuum is produced by H-. Yes. This, this is very consistent, the temperature of the photosphere, and consistent with atomic physics, that we have minus, which produces, which is the main continuum absorber over all the spectrum. So we are having, uh, and this, and applying this to the solar, standard solar model to get perfect run of the intensity versus wavelength of the sun. Yeah. And the indivisible. Yeah. The width, not, not only indivisible, also in the infrared, and infrared. Yeah. So if you look at the history, um, Indeed, the problem was recognized that it was almost impossible until Wilt introduced that possibility of H minus in 1938 with, with uh, the 0.75 electron volts. Yeah. So theoretically, uh, you have that possibility to create a continuum above. The point is that um, it's, you, st you still have a very low density of these, of these and not only that you need to, to postulate a very uh, exotic substance, the point is that whatever, um, whatever creates this continuum, yeah, and whatever, whatever absorbs in the other layers, it's still miraculous that you end up with a plant spectrum. Because oh. where, where, does, where does the plant spectrum beyond the photomedicine go? Where does where does the lime and ultras it's very is. strong very I'm ultra, sorry where do they go? It's quite straightforward to compute the outcoming radiation by a relative transfer calculation, and you see the, the, the 
main point is the source function with the variation with the height and it, uh, it's quite easy to demonstrate that you see more or less the value of the source range function at optical depth unit at each wavelength. And this gives very perfect uh, run of the continuum intensity when you do this, those calculations. And it's not exotic at all. It's, it's not, not what exotic. is exotic would be a metastable or whatever, uh, alkali, alkali, but, but this uh, the H minus is totally natural, you get them because there is the, a very high electron pressure because of the metals right? that give the electrons away and so it's, it's it must completely be natural. natural. <laughs> Even if it's very spurious, uh, if you count how many H minus uh, ions you have in the solar atmosphere compared to neutron <coughs> ion, uh, hydrogen, but uh, that is sufficient and also for other stuff, there's no problem to, to to uh, can give the correct uh, run of, of intensities uh, of the continuum. And then, of course, come the found analyzer uh, as a different absorbers. Uh, but that's another point. Uh, and also, if the solar material is not as we expect, say, in a gas state, how do you then get the, the, the observed uh, P omega uh, diagram. So the, the solar oscillation. Uh, results, okay, these are two issues. With which probe uh, the, the more or less the temperature and, and um, uh, atomic weight average over the depth for the sum, which is very quite perfect to the uh, to the theoretical predictions compared with observations. And this gives more or less, uh, if you may make a, a, let produce the, uh, make a solar model with, with a non gaseous uh, material, you get quite very different uh, oscillation periods, which are by orders of, of magnitude different from what we observe. And the observations are a very good agreement with theory, of standard theory. So these are two issues, I believe. Yeah. Um, I don't deny that they, there is a model that reproduces the data. Oh. I don't deny that the, mo the model, so to speak, works. Mm -hmm. I don't deny that this, this model is established for a very, very long time. But nevertheless, it might be wrong. Yeah, but here you say that we cannot yes. explain the appearance of plus spectra. Yes. And yes. that is not true. Unless you do a lot of very complicated, physically not otherwise justified assumptions, such as Rossland mean opacities. That means averaging over opacities. No, this is physical, so. physically, it's not justified by any other reasoning than to justify the outcome. <coughs> <coughs> Opacity is a very big problem. It's just a method to, to introduce uh, also an opacitus for the radiative transfer. Yeah, exactly. It's a method. That, uh, it's by more more sophisticated calculations, which of course are more time consuming, but uh, that's not the point. Yeah. Yeah, you can also do the same thing with taking the full spectrum into, into account. You don't need to uh, uh, use uh, Rossmann opacities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just an American trick. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I think just we like uh, maybe one more thing about these hot spots, you know, where this material comes back. They are probably produced, I don't know where this movie now, what line exactly where these observations were, but they are probably not uh, produced at the surface, mm -hmm. as we call it usually, uh, where optical tau, uh, visible optical tau is one, but they are probably used, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, somebody that knows that yeah, can correct me at the yeah. transition region. And the transition region can really be considered like a surface. It's almost a, it's a, almost a compact discontinuity, where, where the, the, the temperature uh, it goes up uh, uh, from from uh, hundred thousand to a million degree, and the 
and the density drops dramatically. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, something almost, you know, we could call it, it's a matter of definition, it's, you could call it a surface. And uh, then, of course, when the material splashes down there, it looks like yes, uh, uh, it splashes on a hard uh, surface. And yeah. those, those, uh, those clouds which were expelled are now being channeled uh, by magnetic fields which are dominated there. Yeah, okay. I mean, of course there is a model. I mean, of course there are other opinions. I think that's quite normal in science. And I appreciate that, that you entered the discussion. And it's very good, but I think this discussion has to take place. If we are honest, this is serious science. They might be even wrong, but these are serious arguments, and we have to consider them. Thanks. Okay, then I think we thank you again for this discussion.